The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. I am back, and you are comfortably zoned with me, the Zigzag Man, in Alameda, California. It is almost August in 2018, and um, what a summer, how fast it's gone by. We have good baseball, um, and I've uh, managed over this, this uh, past few months to acquaint myself with someone who has been a real addition to this show. Um, He's Howie Gordon. He's coming back for like the fifth or sixth time. And um, we get to enjoy each other's company. He's a renaissance man, did a little porn, was a sportscaster or a sports writer. Um, one of the most interesting people I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. And um, here you are, Howie. You're back. How you doing? I can't live up to all that. I'm going to hang up right now. That was great. <laughs> well, that was a great show. That was the best show I ever did then. And with that in mind, we'll see you next week. And have Okay. A great time. Be back for another visit <laughs> and a longer introduction. <laughs> right. My next visit is George Goebel, who's... Uh, <laughs> Lonesome George. Old George. Lonesome George Goebel. Yeah, I yeah. I thought of him because this is this uh, network is almost like a, a talk show in, in one way or, or the other, and I remember an appearance by George Goebel on Johnny Carson, and I, I think it was uh, uh, God, who was it? It was Bob Hope was on Dean my, Martin and Frank Sinatra. Dean Martin, yes, yes, you remember it. I sure and, do. Uh, they talk to these guys who are big stars, and there's George over in the corner. Who was the last one out that night. <laughs> right. He was the last <laughs> guest to come on. And his line coming out, he says, I feel like a bra- uh, um, yeah, a pair of brown shoes and a tuxedo or something like, like that. Uh, uh, maybe you remember world. the line for Beta. I don't remember the line. I remember the moment. But the moment I remember yeah. from that show is that every time he would turn to talk to Johnny, Dean Martin would flick his cigarette ash in George Goebel's drink. Oh. <laughs> and George Goebel never never saw it and was always drinking the cigarette ash. <laughs> <laughs> Great show. I get a lot of Carson reruns. And as a matter of fact, I have a fellow podcaster on this network, a fellow by the name of... Um, uh, I'm blanking at the moment. Uh, we won't talk about him this time. <laughs> <laughs> it, it helps when I remember his name to talk about. You remind me very much of my Uncle Izzy. Uncle Izzy was my mentally retarded uncle, who was my mother's yeah, that, brother. That's, that's about right. <laughs> and I grew up with him, and sometimes I would come home, and uh, is, I'd say to Izzy, so I get any calls. He said, yeah, somebody called. Call him back. And I'd say, who was it? He says, I don't know. <laughs> I'd say, yeah, how can I call him back if I don't know who called? And he'd say, ah, it was the wrong number. <laughs> you, you didn't take a number? Well. He, uh, he, he couldn't take numbers. That was beyond yeah. his capabilities. Had, if it weren't for your family, to get serious for a second, someone not just. I don't know if that's possible, busy, but I'll try. But. What happens with folks who uh, um, are disabled, what have you, can't take care of themselves and their family passes away? What generally happens in this year world? Socially? Well, uh, you know, that uh, I've gone into great detail, stories of my Uncle Izzy in uh, my first book, Hindsight, which is uh, in, in, before I get into the part about being in the business, I talk about growing up. So I talk a lot about those issues. And then I have a new book coming out in the fall called Return to Squirrel Hill, which was the community I grew up in in Pittsburgh. And uh, there's more stories about Izzy. And one of the agreements that my wife and I made when we married was that I let her know about he was in my life, and she met him eventually and um, shared the love that I had for him and our family had for him and uh, was willing to commit uh, with me to take care of him when my parents died, 
uh, Izzy was younger than they they were, um, about 10 years or so. So the, idea, the thought was that he would um, probably outlive them. And we were in line to be the caregivers for when he passed. And as fate would have it, um, my mother, when Izzy was 60 years old, my mother went out one morning to uh, – do the shopping for the family dinner, which was her custom, left him home alone. And uh, Izzy, that morning, um, there was a T-shirt that I had made for him that showed his picture uh, on the front of it. And Izzy in, had uh, only one upper tooth because uh, when he was a younger person, he went to the dentist one time and, and bit the dentist. So <laughs> the dentist never invited him back. Um, and uh, consequently, he had just one upper tooth and in the picture on his t-shirt that I had made he was smiling showing the fang as we called it and um, my mother hated it because she didn't he looked quite abnormal and she spent her whole life trying to get him to pass for normal and as I wrote in my book uh, it was like gluing feathers on a cat and calling it a chicken <laughs> trying to get Izzy to pass for normal so anyway, I had this shirt, and she would, he would, she didn't want him to wear the shirt. And that morning, after my mother went out shopping, Izzy put it on, and uh, he walked around the entire neighborhood. And, and it really did take a village in those days. Uh, we had to introduce Izzy to all the new people in the street who would come because he was very odd and uh, could frighten children, and uh, not by meaning to, just by being a big person and not playing by the same rules as everybody else. Um, so we would introduce kind of a ourselves. Baby and, Huey type. Yeah, um, but a harmless critter. And, uh, you know, once people got to know him, he became quite beloved in the neighborhood. So he walked the neighborhood saying goodbye, saying goodbye. He, we didn't realize it, but he was saying goodbye to everybody that morning. And when my mother came home, uh, Izzy was up in here. He lived in our attic, and he was up in the attic. And she walked upstairs to wake him up from his nap. He was taking a nap. And when she touched him, he was ice cold. He had passed, and he was lying there with a smile on his face. So I got a I got a call at that moment. Oddly enough, um, well, it was later in that day. I was hired to be in a movie called Talk Dirty to Me, and in Talk Dirty to Me, I was playing a character much like Izzy, not quite as young as he was mentally. He was diagnosed as an eight-year-old. My character was. Uh, uh, probably more like 14 or 15, slow, more than retarded. And I, I played a guy, I played this guy who was going to have the first sexual experience of his life in this movie. It was a buddy picture with me and John Leslie. Uh, I was the slow character, and John was like a, a, a big brother uh, who found me on the street one day and took me in like a little brother. And it, it's, it's the story of our love, really. Uh, John was... Uh, I don't know if you know John Leslie, but he was like the man's man. He was the, he was the guy with the big cock who played center field, went five for five, and every woman in the world wanted to fuck him. And right. um, I'm shooting the climactic scene in that movie. I know this is a divergent path. You can stop me if, you're, if you don't want to go on this. <clears throat> but the, <clears throat> the climax of that movie, uh, first of all, I get this call in the middle of the night while I'm entertaining everybody a week before we're going to start shooting the movie. We really put on the dog for them. We were... Had a, my wife made a beef Wellington. We had French wines and fancy cheeses. And Anthony Spinelli was there. John Leslie was there. Annette Haven was there. Uh, Aunt Peg was there. All these people who are going to be in the movie. There are about ten of us around. And um, by one o'clock in the morning, we were watching John Leslie and Annette Haven go at each other, which they were good at doing. They were both alpha kind of personalities, and neither took any prisoners. And they were giant stars in the business. And they just were doing this kind of comedy back and forth uh, about each other when my phone rang. And uh, I go in the next room, and it's my father on the phone, which means he's calling at 1 o'clock in the morning in California, so it's like 4 o'clock in the morning in Pittsburgh. This is unheard of. And he's crying. I had never heard my father cry ever. Um, and he tells me that as he had died. And uh, <clears throat> I was in shock. <clears throat> and I'm getting these details, and my wife finds out what's going on. She goes back into the other room and tells all our guests that I've just had a death in the family, and <clears throat> they're all going, okay, we, we're going to go. And when 
the director of Sam, Anthony Spinelli, found out it was Izzy who had died. He knew that the whole movie was in jeopardy, and we were about to start shooting in seven days, so he didn't know if he had a movie anymore. And uh, I didn't know what I Because of do. your mindset, in other words. Well, whether I would be able to make the movie, yeah. or even wanting to make the movie. Um, and uh, I thought I'd be going back home for the funeral. And uh, I quickly found out from my parents that the soonest I could get on a plane would be the next morning, and I'd be home there on 6 o'clock at night. The funeral would already be over. In Orthodox Judaism, they put you away quick. <laughs> they put you underground real quick. So they told me, don't come. And that was shocking. Um, in some ways, I figured it was just my parents protecting me from death. Also protecting themselves from me having to see the full face of their grief. Um, How are you? The were were they Orthodox? Or, yes. Or, uh... Yes, I was raised Orthodox. Okay. Um, were you, early on, I don't know what it evolved to, were you a, an Orthodox Jew yourself? Up you until or... about the age of 14, I went through the bar mitzvah uh, right on track. Uh, around the age of 14, I started having some questions about things, and that was the first time I ever broke any of the rules. I broke the Pesach. Uh, Passover. I, I had an ice cream cone <laughs> on an unleavened cone, <laughs> and I didn't die. I wasn't struck by lightning. And that was I, that I was just, just a coincidence, though. Most well, no, I, 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 that was a, a, it. Was a choice. It was a choice. I, I really had had enough of you know. I, it started out. No, I meant that you didn't die. I meant that as a, a oh yeah yeah yeah. Um, I just had questions about the faith, but there's there's a lot of different tangents that go here. Let me finish the Izzy story, and then we can go into the more religious stuff if you want. Uh, All right. So I, I, just, I can't make it home for the funeral, and I don't, and I'm grieving by myself, and my wife is helping me do this. And I, long story short, I decide to make the movie. It'll be my homage to my dead uncle. Uh, he was a very gentle creature, and uh, I, I, think, I think it was the right move to make. So I make the movie. And there's a climactic scene in the movie where uh, I'm the all, no women want to be with me. I'm just the, the, the retard. I'm the, they make fun of me, and and John Leslie's always trying to get these girls that all want him to give me a throw, just to give me a chance, because I, I want I want to be with a woman. I want to know what it's like, and they none of them want to do it. And so there's a climactic scene where John Leslie, who I was just working with for the first time, I really didn't particularly like him at all. I had met him earlier, and I thought he was a real jerk uh, but Sam wanted us to work together he says you two will be great together I said you're crazy he said trust me um, and I did and so in this moment we're doing this scene John Leslie is playing blues harmonica and he was outstanding musician I didn't know that that surprised me and while he's playing I'm like leaning on his shoulder and I'm supposed to break down crying because no woman wants to be with me and we're shooting this at uh, Twilight Hour, the golden hour they call movies, where you go on real time. You don't light it. You go with natural lighting. So only have about 10, 15 minutes while the light's right, and then it's dark or too dark to, to shoot. So you have to work your scenes in that time frame. So we're under that gun. We're, we're, we're playing the scene at a fancy apartment in San Francisco with a picture window and the bays in the background. The sun's going down. He's playing the harmonica. And on action, I start doing my lines. It's a long scene. It's like five minutes long. And I have to cry and talk. You know, John plays the guitar. And I, I do this. The crying is not hard because I'm in mourning for God's sake. So I'm, I'm playing this scene. And we get through it after five minutes. And when we're done, when the scene is wrapped, the crew starts applauding which is amazing. You don't have that happen on the point set very often. And Sam, the director, like gives him a dirty look and like shuts it off, like turning off a water faucet. He didn't like the scene. He wants to shoot again. Um, so he comes up to me and he puts my face in his hands. He gets close to me and he looks me in the eye and said, just let it out this time. Just let it out. We're going to go again right now. Okay. And action. We're shooting it again. John's playing a harmonica. I start crying to in my lines but I'm not there. <laughs> I'm inside myself, and I'm watching an entirely different movie. And in my movie, what I see 
is my dead uncle sticking his head out from behind the clouds. And he says to me, it's okay. Go ahead. Use it. The hair standing up on my neck. It's the only time in my life I think I've ever really understood acting. And I didn't even know if I approved of it. It reminded me of, a, as a history student, studying in the Middle Ages when the theatrical barnstorming troops would pass through towns in, in Europe, the church would often arrest them, tar and feather them, and send them out of town. They did not believe in theater. <laughs> they thought that no one should play with life, that that was a sin to the medieval mind. And that's what this moment felt like to me. And the next thing I know, Sam's got a big smile on his face. The crew's applauding again. And it's a wrap. We did it. Scene's done. Wow. I was just astonished. It was, it was um, extraordinary. So there's a PS to this story. When the film is cut and uh, Sam is showing it to the producers, and the producers are not especially enlightened people. It's another Vinnie and Arnie from New Jersey. <laughs> They're the producer. <laughs> and they go to Sam, the director, and he shows them this the movie and that climactic scene, isn't it? And they say, Sam, fucking kids crying in a fucking movie. There's no fucking crying in poor movies. The fuck is this shit? We don't get this fucking shit the fuck out of the movie. <laughs> so Sam explains to them the arc of the story. and <laughs> Get this fucking crying scene out of this fucking movie. It's no contest. They own the movie. It's their movie. Scene is cut out. Oh. Sam is screaming. Sam is screaming at them. At the beginning of the movie, they had a three-picture deal with him. By the end of this conversation, they couldn't be in the same room. Uh, so I want to see the scene because it is one of the most – it is the most extraordinary moment in my acting career, period. Nothing like that had ever happened to me. Um, and I wanted to see it. And I call them up, and I, it's on a cutting room floor. They don't fucking care. I say, you can have the footage. Fuck it. You know, fuck it. Yeah, sure. So in between the time I get to go down to Los Angeles to pick up the footage, which is just cut film, um, the movie comes out without that scene in it. And even without that scene, this movie is a giant movie for the porn world. It's not deep throat big, obviously. You've heard about it. But it's really big within the porn world because it's – this was the – why they call it now the golden age of porn. Because for a brief time in the late 70s and early 80s, guys like Anthony Spinelli, Sam Weston, and Chuck Vincent in New York and a couple other directors tried to compete with Hollywood by making real movies that had full-blooded sex in them. And Hollywood couldn't do that, and we could. So – they actually needed actors and acting, which is the only reason I had a career, because I was terrible at the sex. My first, like, ten movies, I got a, I had, like, four hard-ons. <laughs> what do you call a, 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 a hockey player who can't ice skate? <laughs> An actor. Um, that's what I was like in porn. Actually, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah. can't go by me. I've been a New York Ranger fan for 60 years, so... Uh, okay. Let me ask you this. What killed porn? Was it AIDS? It is, porn's not dead. Porn is alive and well. No, but I... It's making more that, money now than that ever. Is, uh, of course it is, but from that... It's that mutating. Is, well, it's mutating. It's mutating. What's, what's really happening... Let me finish that story, then I'll answer that. There's okay. a PS here. It's, so the movie comes out. It's a giant hit. Um, and as soon as everybody wants to make a sequel... And Vinny and Arnie called me up. Yeah, we're going to make another one. You, you and John, yeah, it'd be good. Yeah. But we know we're not working with Spinelli anymore. <laughs> so we'll make it without him. And uh, Sam is my mentor and my friend. And uh, he made this movie. He's the only one that would even dare to try and make a movie like this. Because he actually knew a guy like Izzy in his own life and thought one day he'd like to make a movie about him. And when he met me and knew that I knew that life and that character, that's when he made the movie. Anyway, I wasn't going to make the sequel without him. And John was also, you know, we were like a threesome there. Uh, John and I were like Sam's porn kids. Um, he was daddy and we were the, we were, he was the director and we were the actors. Um, but he was broke. And so when they offered him the part 
in this Talk Dirty to Me Part 2, he wanted to make it without Sam because he needed the money. Sam was saying, don't take it, don't take it, we'll make our own. And uh, John thought it over, he ended up, I said no, he said yes, John went ahead and made it. And they made a movie, they didn't really make the, the same characters, they got somebody to replace me and they made something, it was a title. Porn was just sleazy in the way they just exploited whatever. So Talk Dirty to Me Part 2 has nothing to do with Part 1. And we made a sequel called Nothing to Hide, which was the real sequel. And they, that was even bigger than Talk Dirty to Me. And I got all kinds of awards for that. Anyway, the ending to the first story I was trying to get to was uh, I asked for the footage. They're going to give it to me. But when I wouldn't make the sequel with them, they stopped taking my calls. So... I never saw that scene, ever. But it's in your mind. Oh, forever, forever, forever. Was it the first time that a spiritual being had visited you? And the reason I ask, I have an uncle who visited me shortly after he passed away. And I was in a camper van, and I wake up in the middle of the night or from a nap in the daytime, and this bastard is sitting right in, right there. <laughs> He's real as a mother. And um, I, I'm wondering about that was the only spiritual um, visit, if you will, that I yeah. ever experienced, the only um, uh, anything of its kind, the only religious feeling, you know, nothing, nothing of that like that happened to me. Was this a one-time thing with you? No, um, but it was unusual in that most of those kind of experiences in my life happened during dreams where I actually was asleep. And I would have a, an experience happen where I knew I was sleeping, but something was happening that was super real. It was beyond the dream. There was a, there was a consciousness. There was another place in consciousness I had arrived that had nothing to do with me sleeping. Because I, I was conscious I was sleeping, and it was still going on, sometimes terrifying, sometimes not, uh, but I had a taste of that in my life. This was unique in that it happened while it was a daydream, not a, it happened in the middle of a scene. I just sort of, the scene went on automatic pilot. The words are coming out of my mouth. I was playing a part, but I wasn't paying attention to that. I was awake inside, and that was very unique. I had another moment with Izzy once uh, in a dream where we're driving down the road. It's after he died, and I look over, and there's Izzy sitting in the front seat. And I start screaming. <laughs> and he sees me, and he starts screaming. <laughs> I said, but you're dead, you're dead. He says, I know, I know, but you don't have to scare me. <laughs> uh, uh, I, so I think I we wonder... finished all those things I started wanting to finish. Uh, you asked about is porn dead. Um, that porn, phase of not porn, porn died. Dead, but porn, as you described it, in quote your words, heyday. It's heyday. It's well, it's golden uh, age. But that's a, that's a value judgment. There are many people who hated that kind of porn. Like you couldn't in the, in the love scene that I have in Nothing to Hide. It's it's two like broken people. It was the, the I played a guy named Lenny. And this girl I end up marrying is like the female version of Lenny. And it's like looking at two retarded people. Fuck. Now, are you going to jerk off to that? <laughs> but it's a very poignant, lovely scene. But it's not porn as porn had been. So a lot of people hate that um, because all they want to do is jerk off. They don't want to worry about your lines. And that was always the conflict during the golden age because a lot of fans – didn't want any plot at all. He just wanted to jerk off and come scene to come scene. And uh, wall-to-wall sex, which, uh, so they bought movies like that. They're, those movies were at least uh, half of all that were made at that point in time. And the ones I'm describing that I was a part of were just a rare blip that occurred for about four or five years. Two things happened. One was, because of the nature of porn and the delivery systems of porn. They discovered pretty early on, after making a bunch of higher quality, more expensive movies, that because porn could only play the Pussycat Theaters and the other X-rated theaters, this is before video, um, it had a limited return on how much money it could make. Unless you had a, what they called four-walling, which is what they did with Deep Throat, where they would just rent the theater, period. 
and then they would just depending upon if you keep drawing customers, well, you can keep making money. Uh, and Deep Throat played at one theater in New York for like I think 20 years or so, making a lot of money. But that was the only movie ever like that. That was a, a phenomenon, not just a um, you know a successful film. Um, right. So they discovered that if they spent $150,000 making a movie or if they spent $25,000 making a movie, the return was the same. They weren't going to make more money by making a better movie. You'd win the awards, but who the fuck cares about awards? It's a business. And uh, so we took it that step, but then they discovered that so, you know, so there's no more money in it. The, the, the holy grail that they searched for was what they called the crossover film. That would be a film that was so good that it would cross over into mainstream. And you had the mainstream constantly pushing the envelope toward porn to combat this so that there'd be more hotter sex in regular films. But they never quite got all the way over to the Scarlet Letter, which was the dividing line. Um, and the other thing that happened, that was the first thing, the profit disincentive happened. And the second thing that happened was the video came along. In the By 1983, 84, they discovered that a, a porn film would cost between thirty and fifty thousand dollars to make a really che- <coughs> cheap bad one. They discovered they could make really cheap bad films for video for between two and twelve thousand dollars. The means of production just plummeted. The cost of production just plummeted, and <coughs> it saved. And also, it had the benefit of video could play at home. Um, which is where porn belongs. You don't want to go sitting in theaters and jerking off. Um, that was just weird from the get-go, which is what it was in the in the 50s and the 60s and the, in the 70s. Um, but when we when home video became a phenomenon, it was bound to just and all those theaters died. They just disappeared. And the the means of production, cheaper quality. Uh, in my heyday, I was making a thousand dollars a day. One of maybe four or five actors that, that could command that. Women generally made two to three times that, the big stars I'm talking about, because they, in fact, were the stars that brought the audiences. Most of the audience was male. Um, by the time video hit, the most you would get would be like $250, $300 per scene. The days of $1,000 a day were gone. Uh, and concomitant with that, at the same time that was going on, is when AIDS came along. And all of a sudden... Um, I love you became a death threat because uh, when you fuck somebody, you weren't just fucking them. You were fucking everybody that they ever fucked. And so we had no idea in 84, 83, 84, 85, how the disease was being communicated, <clears throat> how it was being passed from one person to another. And these were scary, weird times. And that's when my wife just said, hey, asshole, you just retired. And I did. Right. It was the days of um, we went from open sex to you got to wear a condom. Well, not so fast. There was an entire year before that even happened because it was like a critical year. That's how because I, I had I was fighting for my career because I had risen risen from the ranks of just utter terror and nobody and this inability to to do sex films, learning how to do it, functioning, become a star. All of a sudden, I'm going to the Hefner Mansion and swimming in a pool. I'm winning awards. I'm in limousines. I'm getting to pick the women I want to work with. I don't want to let this go. It took me 10 years to get to the top of that or near the top of it where, you know, guys like John Holmes were hanging out and Jamie Gillis and John Leslie. Um, I did not want to let it go, and uh, I fought like hell to make it work. But it just got to – there was – we didn't know how AIDS was being passed. The only sure things doctors would tell you is don't fuck um, and uh, monogamy. That was, this, that was the recommended avoidance of the plague for about a year. At the end of the year, we started hearing the term safe sex. Um, and that's when uh, Missy Manners and the Mitchell brothers came along and started trying to uh, sexualize the rubber and the truth about rubbers and porn is the movies where rubbers were in, this is back then, I don't know what's going on now, but back then the movies that had condoms and it made like a third of the money of movies without. Nobody wanted to be reminded in their sexual fantasies that there was a plague out there. And the X-rated business was a business. Uh, they did not want to acknowledge that there was a danger. They, did, but they didn't want to kill the cash cow because it was making a lot of money for a lot of people. And um, 
they didn't particularly care what your your what your whether your life was in danger or not as an actor. Here's the money taker to leave it, and uh, you know I ended up. I remember when I I quit uh, about uh, two weeks later. I had a call from Alex Dorenzi. How would you like to work with a hot newcomer named Tracy Lords? Tracy Lords was like came on like a flaming star when she first got in the business, and uh, you know a woman would make the rounds. They'd go from one, they'd go to from they work one director at a time and work for everybody, and then once they'd been through the the list of about a took about a year and a half, they'd be old news, and then they their star would fade. Well, Tracy was just just come on, uh, unbeknownst to everybody in the beginning, she was 16 years old, and very bold and very beautiful and very wild. Um, and I, I, you know, I wasn't interested, uh, and I said this to Dorenzi, because in, I, you know, not that I wouldn't want to be with a woman like that, um, but because it was a danger, and I didn't, I had new babies, I had two babies, for God's sake, and my wife was saying, when I, the climax of, of, of that argument with me and my wife happened, when AIDS, it was November the 10th, 1984, San Francisco Chronicle, first headline of the heterosexual transmission of AIDS. A couple of Johns with a couple of prostitutes came down with AIDS. Um, and uh, that afternoon, yeah. that afternoon, Michael Rossman, you know Michael Rossman? You know that name? I know the name. Michael Rossman was one of the leaders of the free speech movement at Cal in the early 60s. Uh, he became like my big brother in uh when I moved to California, I moved to a commune where he lived. He was like Mario Savio's best friend. Uh, they considered themselves a leaderless movement at the time in the early 60s, but Mario kind of got picked by the press to be the guy, and that's how it happened. But anyway, Michael was like my adopted big brother, and he was a mathematician um, and a bon vivant, and a, you know, he was a true Renaissance guy himself. He came over to my house that afternoon saying, I've done some calculations based on the figures of the, that are in the paper, and uh, you're in the wrong business at the wrong time. You got to retire. And that was like November '84, and I had three big movies lined up for the, the December. Um, it was going to make me like about eight grand, which was huge money for me. Um, and it was going to be our Christmas, so I did not want to not do these movies. And my wife picked. My wife by then, this was ten years into it, was already ready for me to be done with porn. It started off in something cute that her husband did to something that she'd had enough of. Um, so she was lobbying for me to get out of the industry. And I didn't, like I told you earlier, I took a long time to get to the top. I wanted to enjoy the fruits up there. Um, so I was fighting with her. And when Michael came over, that added power to her argument. And I said to both of them, they're just trying to sell papers. Fuck this shit. I'm going ahead. I'm, gonna, I'm making these movies. And I went out and I made the movies. When I came home, um, I went to bed with my wife that night, and I reached for her, and she said to me, quote, don't you think it would be prudent if one of us remained alive to raise the kids, unquote. That was the brick wall. Uh, I could not come up with anything around that. In the morning, I woke up. I was not only retired, I was monogamous. And like I said, it was a whole year later before safe sex came into the nomenclature. And condoms, uh, latex condoms at that, not the ones that were organic, because um, the disease passed right through those. Um, latex condoms would uh, keep the angel of death away from your door, because everybody was dying then who had AIDS. There was no cocktails and oh. medications and protect long life. A huge number of people died, uh, mostly gay in San Francisco. It was um, hor horrible times. Uh, yeah, scary times. Almost very scary times. Kids in their 20s, less, 18, 19, 20. Yeah, um, yeah. there was no cure. There's still no cure, but they, 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 they certainly have managed to prolong life and have the things that slow the progression of the of AIDS to the diseases that will kill you. Yeah, but how is like everything else? If you have the money to buy the medication, it, um, you can live longer. But there are an awful lot of folks that don't have either the money or the um, 
the guts to go get tested in the first place. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a, a big part of it. Um, and not having, you know, not having a medical system in this country that makes sure that everybody gets a chance to live, no matter how much money you have, just like these doctors took the Hi- Hippocratic Oath. I don't think money had anything to do with the Hippocratic Oath. Um, so our system is skewed anyway. And um, another thing, it took the government so long to come out with information about AIDS that um, they covered up the testing, they covered up the research. Um, well, there was, was the, you know, there was some uh, moral de- debate going on. A lot of people in government, you know, are thinking, well, the homosexuals are dying. Good. <laughs> Good. It's a win-win situation. Why do we want to fund research for that? We're wasting exactly. money on keeping was, people alive who are our enemies. The homosexuals that were dying, it, it turns out that there were uh, heterosexuals, but it was uh, needle users and um, they didn't care Patience. about them either. Patients. That was the first. That that that, that article in, uh, on November 10th said three people are at risk for the disease. That's um, intravenous drug users, um, homosexuals, and uh, a- people from Haiti. There was an, an inordinate number of people from Haiti who were coming down with the disease. Yeah, and, there was and the X-rated business that, had that, you know two out of three. Sexuality. I don't think that was ever mentioned that um, people didn't put two and two together. They they thought um, that didn't go on, or they, I don't know. I, well, it did in porn, because there were many actors, not many, but there were some big-time people. A guy named Jack Wrangler was very gay, and he was bi. Um, so he made a lot, he became a big star in heterosexual porn, and he played in both... He played in a lot of gay films as well as heterosexual ones. And after that headline, um, a lot of people wouldn't work with anybody that he worked with anymore. He was not welcome on the heterosexual sets uh, because of what he might be carrying. As I said, like we had a, you know, the, the test back then, there was some test that they developed around 80, in the 84 year that wouldn't tell you if you had the disease or not. It could tell you if you'd been around it. And then you had to wait six months to see what it developed into. I mean, they really were starting from square one uh, in terms of coping with this disease. It was a unique situation. And a lot of money did get into research because despite the fact that it was slow to pick up mass funding, there was still a lot of private funding going on and and help uh, money being allotted from various charities and fundraising efforts to help people uh, deal with this. Um, there were a lot of yeah, discoveries that go- came the rather quickly. The government was doing, doing practically nothing in terms of research. Well, we, who do we have in office now? We had the Republicans. It was Reagan. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, not so, that I've talked a lot of politics lately because of things, uh, the way things are. First of all, it is, at this point, it isn't a Republican or Democratic Trump isn't a a Republican or Democratic problem. He's the country's problem. And the two parties have to come together, make sure that um, he doesn't get to spend any time alone with the Russian leader anymore or um, with NATO. (laughs) We can't let him out anymore. It's like. Well, uh, I don't know how much of a Republican party is left. You know, you're giving them more credit than they, 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 they are. I mean, Ryan, the leadership is still supporting Trump. Um, they're yeah, not, but they're slow. They're not, they're not putting that kind of – I think they're backing away, and I think that with the Mueller investigation, things are closing in uh, on on Trump. And, uh, well, uh, let's hope. Maybe this you is know, just wishful hope. thinking because how could things get any worse well, I don't even surmise that. But the, you, you know this writer, his name is Umar Haik, U-M-A-I-R-H-A-Q-U-E. He writes um, astonishing, astonishing, incredibly incisive um, pieces these days about the, um, falls of the, the fall of democracies to fascism, uh, which is not 
an uncommon. I mean, it's happened enough that there are there are symptoms that can be identified, and he's oh, the he's press really uh, negating the the power of the press uh, for one, um, separating children from uh, from their parents shows a basic inhumanitarian um, mindset that is going to fuck us all up. We're, we're not going to be able to come back from this. I mean, I'm saying that um, rhetorically. I certainly hope we will. But um, He wrote a piece called, This is what it feels like when a democracy dies, an insider's perspective on the last bittersweet days of freedom. And he talks about, like, uh, you know, how it comes on. It's like it's not like the with a bang, but a lot of whimpers. Anyway, um, this is this clearly is what we <laughs> – the subtext of all of our nightmares and dreams these days. And on the other hand, we do what we can to change the subject and to um, hope life goes on. And the, Michael Rossman wrote a book once called The Wedding Within the War. Um, about uh, remembering that to, to live life while you're in the struggle. Otherwise, it's just all going to eat you alive. Yeah. He was talking about the Vietnam era at that point in time. But taking us back to the very beginning, I'm sitting here looking at my desk. I had two notes here that I wanted to do today, and we went on a whole other path. First of all, is well, I had a porn let's in baseball. Let's do them, Howie. Let's, we're on a roll. Let's I have a porn in baseball moment. Uh, I was directing a movie for Seika. Seika had hired me to direct a movie that she was producing and starring in. And we were on the set, and I was wearing a Cubs shirt. Um, I don't know why. I got I played for the Cubs in Little League, the Greenfield Cubs in Pittsburgh. But uh, that was the only reason I figured I had a Cubs shirt. So uh, somebody had said to me on the set, I was standing there next to Seika, and they said, oh, are you a Cubs fan? And I said, oh, no, fuck the Cubs. And Seika said, I did. <laughs> she was living in Chicago. <laughs> and I thought that was a great moment. Um, and the other thing I have here, I had two of two pieces uh, standing in front of me. I figured I'd let you make a choice if you wanted to hear one. Um, this is more of a baseball coincidence. It's when I was inducted into the Hall of Fame. There's a porn Hall of Fame. So I wrote a piece about uh, being inducted into porn's Hall of Fame. And the other piece I have um, as an option was uh, answering a fan's email. about. They just assumed that there was this huge dichotomy, in the words of, uh, he spoke, between me as a husband and father of three family guy and Richard Pacheco, the veteran porn star. And I answered his letter. So uh, if you want to hear one of those, I'll take you on that ride. Um, I would like to hear them both. How about that? Well, uh, we could we'll do one for this issue because these these go on a while. Um, All right. A, do, we'll start with the Hall of Fame and uh, do the one you choose. We'll see how you feel better afterward. Uh, okay. Porn's Hall of Fame. My title is a slice of immortality, and a side of fries. <laughs> there are halls of fame, and there are halls of fame, but a Hall of Fame is a Hall of Fame, and should you ever be voted into one. It will no doubt fill you with a well-earned sense of pride and accomplishment. At some level, the X-rated Hall of Fame is certainly no different. On January 9th at Bali's Casino in Las Vegas, along with the 1999 entering class of directors Lasse Braun, Patty Rhodes, and Bob Chin, photographer Suze Randall, actresses Nikki Charm, Deirdre Holland, Tammy Monroe, and Annie Sprinkle, Richard Pacheco, award-winning actor, writer-director, reported smallest cock to ever hit the big time, and father of my three teenage children, was inducted into Porn's Hall of Fame. While stock markets did not surge in Japan, ticker tape parades were not held in New York City, and congratulatory calls did not emanate from the White House, it was still a momentous day. In the words of famed artist and sex educator Betty Dodson, celebrate your time in the business, Howie, and fuck them, because they're all just jealous. Happy orgasm all through the new year and into the next millennium. My induction took place during the Adult Video News Awards Show on a Saturday night in Las Vegas, 
which climaxed the recent gigantic four-day consumer electronics show. If you ever doubted that adult films and videos have become big business, consider that the banquet room at Bally's, which hosted the ceremony, also serves as an airplane hangar for at least two deluxe 747s and the space shuttle Intrepid when the room is not in use as the largest dining facility in the Western Hemisphere. The rumor was that there were at least 3,000 people attending this intimate little buffet that began at 7.30 p.m. and is probably still going on now. From where my wife and I sat at table number 147, Binoculars were required to see the stage, but they found it easier and cheaper to strategically place giant large screen televisions throughout the Great Hall. Most of us in attendance were actually watching the show on TV. When it came my turn to mount the podium, I left 15 minutes early, packed a canteen, stuffed some dinner rolls in my pockets, and hired a Vegas cab driver named Mo to get me to the stage on time. Speaking of time, in my day, Sonny, when I was a young Turk, the awards in the Hall of Fame were the province of the Adult Film Association of America. This institution, heavily dominated by the adult theater owners like the Pussycat Chain, died in the mid-80s, along with their theaters when video replaced film as the chief modus operandi of the industry. I remember the Hall of Fame portions of those award shows with considerable embarrassment. Old-timers, who most of us current actors did not know, would collect their Hall of Fame trophies and then stand at the podium, awaiting the customary quiet to give their heartfelt speeches. It would never come. The disrespect of many in the audience would manifest in animated table conversation, loud laughter, and the clinging and clanging of dining as these poor souls would try to address the crowd at this pinnacle moment of their careers, if not their lives. If you had any compassion at all, it was brutal to bear witness. Many newly inducted Hall of Famers ended up trying to speak over the din. I remember one sad soul attempting to defy the audience by just standing there and glaring from the podium in demand of their silence. The poor bastard wanted this moment to mean something. Though many in the audience shushed and scolded the defiant pig fucks among us who would not allow it to happen, it became a cruel game, which the would-be speaker lost. Defeated and dismayed, he eventually departed the stage, sadly underwhelmed by the honor which had just been bestowed upon him. The adult film and video industry has always been one capable of exhibiting both the greatest in nobility and the absolute cruddiest of humanity within its ranks. A man, who may, a man who may have spent years in prison in defiance of government censorship can't get quiet from a liquored-up, drug-crazed, tongue-pierced stud trying to hit on the tit-spilling, bush-flashing starlet sitting next to him. I suppose it just goes with the turf. A society that so downgrades its sexual media to the point where amateurs and criminals become the chief contributors, gets what it deserves. And armed with these kinds of memories, you might understand why I did not bother to write a big deal speech despite the apparent loftiness of such an occasion. I figured I'd wing it and be ready for anything. I discovered that AVN, the Adult Video News, in taking over the awards, had solved the loud audience problem by having Bollies utilize a sound system capable of keeping the Mormons awake in neighboring Utah. Good thing, too, because I can tell you that most of the people at table number 147, where my wife and I were sitting, just didn't give a shit about what was happening a mile away on the stage. Our table was marked Talent. I introduced myself to a shy, sweet, young, blonde starlet who was seated next to me. She surprised me by sharing that she was up for a Best Anal Award. Her husband knew my work and was excited to talk about the good old days. Two other actors and actresses who had apparently been given permission from their respective parole officers to attend the event also shared the table with us. They were perpetually and petulantly loud, boorish, inappropriate, disrespectful, and generally upholding the honor of the gutter, 
where many within the sex industry argue that porn rightfully belongs. These dog turds were drinking wine, hard liquor, ingesting Lord knows what pills and powders, and spilling their water glasses with an amazing frequency and consistency. At one point, when the shy, sweet blonde tried to quiet them, she was greeted with an ugly blast of hostility for her efforts. I suggested to one of the male oafs that they take their noise outside. He thought I was challenging him to go outside. Sensing danger, my wife whispered as much in my ear. I could see him trying to size me up. Though I hadn't been seeking, in, though I hadn't been seeking such an adventure in machismo, I was just pissed off enough to not want to back down from one either. Not this one, anyway. Though I was old enough to be this kid's father, he was drunk, and I wasn't. I'd been on a slow burn since they'd first brought their chaos to our table, and I was just crazy enough to enjoy the testosterone levels rising. And why am I telling you all this? Because on a day when you're going to be ducted into a Hall of Fame... The poor bastard wants this moment to mean something. If our bad boy had made a move, I'd have met him in midair like in a kung fu movie. But the Mike Tyson lurking in us all did not break through on this night. Mumbling soon replaced cursing as the table backed down from Flashpoint. A degree of civility had somehow been maintained, and the show, still going on in the next county, did not miss a beat. I was part of the second group of inductees that night. Bob Chin, Suze Randall, Andy Sprinkle, and I were wonderfully represented by Miss Veronica Hart. She gave us kisses and plaques. And speaking from more than one personal experience, Veronica Hart is truly a Hall of Fame babe all by herself. One of the premier actresses of our generation and a former sexual wild child of the highest caliber, she has made herself into one of porn's respected elders down there in the San Fernando Valley. Though married now, with children of her own, she remains an industry force for quality and human dignity in a sea of schlock, misogyny, and fast lane waste. I appreciated her being the one to present us our awards. It was very different down there near the stage, by the way. Within a football field of the podium where all the current X-rated heavy hitters were seated, there was quiet and decorum appropriate to the onstage activities. The chaos going on in the outer regions was not at all intrusive. As with the first set of inductees, Bob Chin, who directed me in my very first film, The Candy Stripers, and Suze Randall, who I remembered primarily as the photographer of a hustler, offered very short thank yous in their speeches. I was glad that I hadn't prepared any opus because common sense would have dictated that I abandoned it. Annie Sprinkle, ever the surprise and creative artist, delivered an unexpected and heartfelt tribute to Deep Throat star Linda Lovelace for being so instrumental in helping to give birth to what's now become the X-rated industry. And I, in my turn, milked the cow for what I could get. I properly thank Richard Freeman, the editor of the underground zine Batteries Not Included, who had campaigned actively for my inclusion into this Hall of Fame. I thank Adult Video News for offering me this little piece of immortality. It was nice to think of your contributions being recognized and frozen in time. I would have liked to have stuck my dick into some warm cement, but it wasn't to be part of the ceremony. I mentioned the name of Anthony Spinelli, my mentor, my director, and applause burst out. I did not have to say anything more about the famed director, who had been the backbone of my entire career. I looked out into the audience and saw a table with Joey Silvera, John Leslie, Jamie Gillis, and some of the other old cronies smiling up at me. I remember Joey complaining in days gone by of having to fuck the same women over and over again because there weren't that many in the business. It had been a big problem for him. I remarked that he didn't seem to have that problem anymore, as there seemed to be a much bigger pond these days sporting an endless supply of fresh-faced beauties from which to choose. Lastly, and most importantly, I thanked my wife who had been at my side from the beginning to the end. I knew of no other actors who had gone through their careers married, let alone who still remain married to that same person. Not many women on this planet could have handled it, but my wife is truly my life's partner and remains so to this day. I shared the irony with the audience, 
that despite having had sex with 90% of the women in the Hall of Fame, and at least 43 women named Candy, the hottest sex on earth for me turned out to be right at home with the mother of my three kids. She said that it made her cry. Since it took me two and a half days to make the return trip back to our table, her tears were dry by the time I got there, but I'll take her word for it. Nice, Howie. That was very well read, very well written, uh, and it's a good combination. Thanks for coming on, my friend. You'll a pleasure as usual. Um, you'll come back on a regular basis, I'm hoping. Well, I always enjoy our talks. That's all I want to hear. Thank you, and uh, stay healthy this week, and we'll do it again next week. Okay. Thanks for listening, everybody. I uh, enjoyed this one a great deal. Howie's terrific. Be well, and uh, adios. Bye-bye.